So I'm Rosie Haslam. I'm a director at Street Sense, um, we're a place strategy consultancy. So today's topic is very relevant to me. I was really looking forward to speaking today, but also really looking forward to it joining these two guys here on the here on the stage or on the sofa. So Colin McGady, Chief Creative Officer at BDG. So Colin and I worked together many many years ago. Is that like a disclaimer, so that <laughs> if we argue or we just got bicker. the yeah, <laughs> just just old old issues. I'll, I'll just mediate if it, <laughs> if it kicks off. <laughs> And Lee Penton, CEO and founder of Penton. We haven't worked together, but I followed you for many years. So um, yeah, <laughs> lovely to be here today. Um, so yeah, the title of today's session, which we pulled together with Alex, Alex in the back, who brought us together. Um, so how do we shape places um, around human behavior? So we've obviously been brought together because it's key to all of the work that we do. So I thought if we just kick off today by each introducing ourselves a bit, spending a couple of minutes talking about what are the sort of places that we make? Um, how do we shape them around human behaviour? What are the sort of things that we're bringing into that? And, and critically, why? why? Why is this important? Why are we working around um, creating places for people? Do you want to go first, Colin? Or do you? No, Lee, let's start with you. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, places and people, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a biggie, isn't it? And I think that um, since, you know, since I founded Penson, I've always said that, you know, people feel first and think second. So, um, you know, emotions in, in everything we do is so, so, you know, so important to us. But actually, you know, the emotional side of, of spaces, you know, we're, we're put in spaces where, you know, we're designed to think in spaces, but not actually really feel in spaces. So, you know, whether it be, you know, situations where, you know, when we first started Penson, you know, more effort was being put into the design of wine bars on an emotional level, but actually we spend a fraction of our time in the wine bar or the pub or the restaurant and the I majority of our time in I the office. <laughs> and, um, well, that's a reputation, that's a rumour, isn't it, you know? But uh, maybe in later life, maybe, but um, before I had children. And um, no, so I think for me, it's always been a bit back to front in that spaces have always uh, forced people to work around spaces and not the other way around and that just all seems completely back to front and and equally in you know in the patterns of life um, you know if you think that you know that I mean it's absolutely stupidity that that you know we're all pre-covid we're all kind of like locked in our offices from nine till five you know where we're all getting on the same train you know we're all, all, all getting hemmed into these sort of small spaces we've all got different agendas programs pressures time frames but we're all having to sort of travel and, and be in these buildings at the same time from nine till five but then you know we've got a high street problem uh, with retail so when when everyone leaves the offices at sort of five o'clock six o'clock in the evening all of the shops close you know, and that's the, that's the that's the craziness of the fundamentals of the system that we had, and and it, all of this relates to experience. It all relates to everyone's lives inside and out of of, of you know city centres and offices and and all the different you know categories of buildings. And and as time's gone by, you know, even pre-COVID, some of the buildings that we were designing pre-COVID were were really breaking down all of these these sort of you know fundamentals that we've deeply believed to completely back to front um, and and you know now we're kind of finding that we're sort of being licensed to thrill a little bit because of covid um, because people are now wanting you know these these sort of more loosened up ways so it's an exciting time and and um, and yeah I think people come first in everything and uh, buildings don't really respect that very much necessarily yeah and how um, how would you say you integrate into the design process that Kind of how do you integrate people and the thinking about how they behave, how they work, what they like, all of those. A lot of this pre-existed COVID, but now these new trends and how people are living. How are you responding to that? Well, I mean, ironically, by not being an architect and not being a designer um, and, and not drawing, you know, actually, um, you know, we're, we're life facilitators. You know, you you have to think first, and and it just so happens that you draw. Um, so, it. it it's a different response to every single different situation, project, space, floor. Um, you know, you, you, you have to design a space so that it, it literally encompasses what that person or group of people or organization needs to do. You know, fun, you know, enjoyment, energy, all of these sorts of things that, you know, don't necessarily really get thought of first, have to come first. Um, atmospheres and you know the, the the feeling of 
you know, the feelings of people. If you, if you walk into a, a hotel and, and it's got a bit of a weird carpet and you don't feel comfortable kicking your shoes off, it's a fail. You know, if, if I walk onto a, a lovely boat and it's got beautiful teak decks and, and you kick off your shoes, the feeling that you get that goes through you is immense and you just yeah. suddenly relax. So spaces have to, you know, respond to these emotions. So by not being an architect and not being a designer, you can actually think about all of the other things that really matter first and then you become the architect and the designer to create the space that goes around it. So I've always said that you know, what we do is 10% design, the other part of it is creating an amazing experience that thinks about people first. And it's always been that way and always will be. And if, nece you know, if necessary, the 10% the, the for design will probably go to 5% going forwards. So uh, it's different for every single situation. Oh, <laughs> well, I think where we've found it interesting in the last few years, and we had a conversation beforehand about not mentioning the P word. Yes, yeah. So let's not mention the P word, but I guess place has changed, and actually our thoughts around how we respond as a studio to a place has, has, has changed quite a bit. Um, when we first, you know, 2020, we first went into lockdown, one of our first responses to thinking about how we can help people with place was to launch a, a website that gave them access to furniture that they might want in their home. Because mm. a lot of people don't have an office space in their home. And so how do you integrate sort of functional pieces of furniture that look good in your home but allow you to work well and you know, thinking that this might last six or eight weeks. It's lasted a lot longer. Um, and so that was very much about us looking at suddenly, well, well, if we're going to, you know, as we move into this new space, what does it mean to be maybe more digital? And what does it mean to be more sort of thoughtful and giving around our knowledge and our understanding? Mm -hmm. So that was a free to access, not for profit, out it went, won a London Design Award, and people get to access it. And that thing about people first and about that idea Ooh. of when you're at home and you're working is a very different experience as you were saying when you're at home and you're relaxing and you kick your shoes off and you want to sit down and relax at the end of the day is a very different thing to getting up in the morning putting your shoes on but not leaving the house to get in and work right so yeah. your frame of mind has to change yeah. so i think as a studio sort of giving access to giving people access to sort of tools and knowledge and data and insight that might help them you know have a better experience of yeah. one space one place two very different functions was something that we sort of looked at um and then right you know if you come right forward to now, um, a project for a tech company which was very much about adaptability, but not, it was, you know, end user, you know, you, if you're turning up, so you're, you're not no longer working from home, you're turning up in the office, I need something right now, I need a, a, a particular experience of space, I need a scale, maybe I need a different degree of comfort to someone next to me, I need a different degree of performance to someone next to me, how can I influence and impact and change that space immediately to make it work for me? in a way that maybe you can do at home a bit better. So how do you bring maybe some of that mm. um, self-control or um, ability to define your space? It's your more, much more individual behavior. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But interestingly, collective. So if I'm in, I'm probably in to see other people. They're all, they all need the same requirements as me because we're doing a collective mm. task. So let's make that task the best it can, or that place the best it can be to support that task. And so giving them instant sort of ability to change things on the spot, not phone someone up and say, I need a room or I need a particular piece mm. of AV, but change it right there and then is also something. And I guess both, both of those examples are very much, as, as Lee was saying, people, very much people first. Mm. Mm. And so, you know, if you can get that bit right. I mean, it, working on a, on a book at the minute, which is coming out at the beginning of next year, where we're talking about the future of officing as a verb, not office space. And actually, the, the, the question, there's, I think there's nine questions on the spectrum of work. And the question about place is number seven. So there's so many more questions to answer mm. about experience, people, mm. organisation, before you even get to what the space is. And space is shaped around all of that. Exactly. So that's why yeah. it's further down the spectrum, because you need to answer all those things first before you get to it. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, life, you know, it's that old phrase, isn't it? Life comes before work. And it, and it does. You know, you look at, you know, the, the reasons why people go to work is, you know, the first reason is that they have to put a roof over their family's heads. So they have to earn the money. That's reason number one very shortly followed by they like to have social interaction, self-development and career development and, and those sorts of things. So 
Um, but life does come first. That's the point of you know all of this, and and it, it doesn't get put first necessarily. And you know, I, I I'm I'm you know I've 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 grown up my business through you know in a, in a big sector of you know office workplace design. Um, I'm now the person saying that actually you know the, the word office it, it needs to disappear because. Um, you know, work is no longer a place that, that you go to. It, it's not a building, and it's the same with you know a hotel. I mean, you know, with our Joe and Joe brand, we completely decategorise what a hotel is. Um, so five, six, seven years ago, we're starting to to, to decategorise these fixed, you know, purposes within buildings, and it's and it, it goes from you know decategorisation of, of, of buildings, you know, a hospital a bar, a hotel, an office building, whatever it might be. But also the, 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 the COVID thing has proven that the decategorization of actually a house is, is also broken down a little bit. As, as long as spaces deliver what you need them to do in a really flexible way, you can live a much more freer, satisfying, flexible, efficient, multi-purpose, multi-outcome you know, life. And I think that's for me, that's that's where things really have, have got to start going, and um, you know we're we're designing headquarters now that you know at the top of the cheese grater tower across four floors, where a press of a button it turns into a nightclub, um, you know, and it, it it's 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 fascinating stuff. Mm. So life has to come first, um, and that's that's the bottom line. Yeah, and I think, and are you finding that it's that idea is definitely more front of mind. I mean, the whole idea of it's interesting that you say that, a reminder probably to all of us that a few years ago we were, a couple, two years ago we were trying to suddenly create mini offices in our homes and then there's that reflection back of now people are going back into an office, whatever that may be, for however many days a week and what are they expecting of the office and you know, there was a lot of talk early on that we're going to make offices more domestic because actually people have got used to this more informal behaviour. Is that what people want in the office or actually is there you know, they have a home and that serves certain purposes, but actually going into the office is a more directed I'm going with this thing one now. Okay. <laughs> I had a bug there pre... You used the COVID one, so I'll use COVID instead. Yeah, we also yeah. banned the word office, which... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I you, think you, I used that. You went in early, <laughs> so yeah. free reign. Yeah. Um, I had a problem, you know, pre, pre the pandemic, which was the domestic domestication of the workspace. Mm. I, I mean, it's the, the balance of work and life. I like to go home and, to your point, kick your shoes off, and it feels like a very different experience than when you were mm. in the office. But it was happening, so maybe it was a drive towards more of a hospitality feel, yeah. more of a service environment mm. in the workplace than, than yeah. a home environment, right? So there was just the semantics, I get that. But. Well, no, but I think that is different. I think it's going to the office for an experience, that, a hospitality experience, is quite different to a home. Like, you want to feel comfortable, yeah. but you kind of want to... I don't know, I don't want to turn off my pyjamas to work, but... Yeah. <laughs> but most people are if they're at home. <laughs> so, so, I think that's, so now, I think that's become even more important. I think the, 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 the balance and the difference, and, and, and you can have... It's, it's been very sort of conscious of the fact that when you're at work, you're working, when you're at home, when you're not working, you're relaxing, and those things can happen in the same place, but you've got to be very sort of distinctive and purposeful about mm. making sure that you are able in your solution to... Um, you know, whether it's a nightclub in an office, but, but when it's a nightclub, when you flick that switch and it becomes a nightclub, unless it feels like a nightclub, it's not, it's just an office party, mm. right? Um, yeah. So, so it's the same thing at home, even in a small environment. When you're at work, you should make it feel like work, and when you're not, sh mm. and, and blending those things, so trying to make an office feel more like a home is a horrible idea, I think, because you're, you're, you're mm. too busy blending. Well, it's, it's, it. it's a gimmick, it's fake. You know, and, and, there, right. and, and there was that, you know, that, there was that big push, wasn't there, in the sort of, I don't know, from 2006 or so onwards, that, you know, the office is the new home, and you know, but it, but people were still designing the same office building and just <laughs> putting another word on top of it. I mean, it's it's completely fake and gimmicky, and I think now for what's exciting is that, you know, because of because of COVID for some, but for us, actually, we've deep always deeply believed this is that. You know the, the the social side of why you go into, and let's not let's not call it an office, but you know what we're finding with with the with the nightclub scenario is that, and it, and it does go into a proper full pelt, full on <laughs> genuine nightclub. It's amazing, and during the daytime, it's a machine which is which is just consuming, 
you know, carbon dioxide with lots of plants and things like that. But it's, it's not, you know, covered in plants to make it look as though it's doing that. Mm. It's actually doing that, you know. So that gives you a different experience in terms of, you know, the air that you breathe and things like that. So what, what's having to now happen and, and what we should be pushing as a, as a sector, as construction, design and experience, branding and all these sorts of things, is that we should be pushing really genuine you know, functional, you know, bonuses out of these buildings. Mm. We're not going to call an office or a place or anything like that. But it's, it's got to be, you know, proper, proper, genuine reasoning for doing these things for the right deep reasons. Yeah, um, and, and in terms of then process, so if, if we're talking about human behaviour, how would you say in your work you, you actually understand human behaviour to, to, to match, to in, in, allow those functions to happen? And has that changed? pre and post COVID or just over time? It's not changed dramatically. I mean, I've, we've spent a lot of time, we've been running focus groups globally for the last 18 months. We've had 3,000 participants and we're asking them about, we were asking them about the short term, the medium term and the long term. So, you know, when you were, when you were forced to work from home, how were you coping? And again, mm. these were very sort of human questions, not mm. like, you know, how big is your workspace at home? Uh, you know, what's your density of your workspace in your home environment? <laughs> you know, which was the old real estate question, yeah. right? So, and then uh, midterm when people were, because globally, of course, it was fluctuating in terms of the stage you were at in terms of in your, your government restrictions with the pandemic. Um, I've said the P word. Um, so <laughs> it had to happen. You said office, so we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll put it in the swear pot. Yeah. 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 Um, was then, so how were you balancing that? Mm. You know, not just how much time you spent at home in the office, but how were you feeling your connection with the business? How were you communicating with other people? Were, were you working collaboratively? Were you going in and just hoping people were there? You know, there's all those sort of questions coming out. And then what was your vision for the long term? And so we've, we've been asking a huge amount of sort of information and, and that's become really interesting, but it is also just like perception. So most people will tell you that they're really, um, they've been really productive when they're working from home. Well, their perception of productivity and CFO's perception of productivity and the financial results of business are very, are very mm -hmm. different, right? So, it's, so, but historically, you know, we worked together. The, mm. the, you know, you always had that distinction between perception and observation. The bit that's missing, of course, is the observation. We don't really know what the future mm. is because we're not able to observe people yet yeah. in a, over a period of time and after a period of time from what we've been through to see how it's all settling. Mm. Um, so that, and I actually think that tension on the unknown is really exciting because I think it's a mm. moment where you can have conversations and say, well, don't wait for that, do this. Yeah. And Try what if it. it doesn't work? You know, what, and, and that age of kind of exploration or experimentation at the minute is really quite exciting. So you're saying to clients, you know, yeah, take 25% of your footprint and put a nightclub in or, you know, we, we put, you know, it wasn't quite a nightclub. Yeah, how are you measuring the behaviour of the nightclub? <laughs> well, you can see it. You can see it in front of your eyes. You know, so you have to go there every night to. Just well, well, I mean, it, you know, we, 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 you know, we had an almighty humdinger of a of an opening party with just the staff members, um, and the atmosphere was electric. What was really interesting is that for the two weeks following that, the atmosphere was still electric mm. because different relationships had had been you know, discovered, um, you know, I mean, you know, like we, I mean, for goodness so sake, I mean, we, it, I mean, if I hear, if I hear in my life one more time that it's all about the water cooler moment, I am going to give it all up, you know. It's all about the nightclub it's, moment. It's now all about the sociable moment between people, but on a proper, genuine, sociable level. And, you know, if, if, if we fall into a pattern where, you know, people, and we're talking about work, and actually, you know, this is about places, isn't it? But work's a big one, isn't it, right now? But if, if, the, if, the, if the building that we go to that used to be called an office is the place that we go to to socialise, every business needs a centre. It needs an epicentre. Without an epicentre, a business is going to struggle. I had a month where every CEO, ranging from the global CEO of Hyundai, to you know, um, a gaming software company, a, a Tencent. By sheer coincidence, behind the scenes, every CEO said to me, Lee, don't, don't tell anybody this, but basically we're on a 60% productivity problem here. Mm -hmm. And they all said 60%, every single one, never met one another, you know, they all had exactly the same problem. So 
if, if, if we all go somewhere where we have to go to the business, and it's ironic, isn't it? We used to, we've, we've just been slagging off calling the office the home. Um, but actually, if, if the building that we go to is, is the, the epicenter house or the home of the business, but we don't necessarily go there to work there because we're working at home, but we socialise and we come together. Who knows what's going to come out of the pattern, but it, it, the things we've seen from loosening things up have already been amazing. And you, you don't need to research it, you can just watch it happen in front of your eyes. So it, we're moving on from the water cooler moment to something way, 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 way bigger. And, and that's really exciting. But you know. we have a different relationship to work though in the UK than a lot of other places. Of course. So yeah. I, I think our way of working is a very social way of working. I think mm. we, we form stronger relationships and, and, and longer, more meaningful relationships with our colleagues that go beyond mm. the workflow of I need you to do this for me to do this for us yeah. to deliver this. So, and, and I look at the work we're doing in the States and, and, and I think there's a real problem in the US, mm. North America. In Much terms more of, transactional work. Well, yeah. Work is nine to five and, yeah. and, and the, uh, you look at the rates of people coming back into the office um, they're, they're way, way lower than yeah. we are now. You know, and they're not that far behind us in terms of their curve on dealing with the pandemic. Yeah. Um, but they don't see work life as we see work life. You know, we're much more, and, and, and which is absolutely fascinating because I just imagine they would. You know, my mm. naivety of having working there for three years now. But it's just, and it's fascinating. And, and, and to your point, the experience piece is going to be the bit that breaks it down. Is mm. yeah. they're going to have to come back to a place that is vastly different to where it was. But I don't think they yet see the benefit of the social over the work. And yeah. so, draw, so, so that's a huge cultural change piece that's going to have to yeah. happen. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm going to come back in and I'm just going to hang out. I'm like, yeah, come back in and hang out. Yeah. But when, when am I going to do my work? You, we, you'll be doing that at home for the rest of the four days a week that you're yeah. not coming in. But it's. But what are you going to hang out in? Are you going to hang out in a, in a space that you know, um, it looks nice, and it and it's okay, but is that really going to give you that magic? I mean, if you if you you know everyone's got their favourite bar or kind of restaurant or they've, they've, someone's got their favourite mug, you know, just the way that the handle works. Everyone's got their favourite little mini experience in life where it all just all just clicks into place. You couldn't really put your fingers on why it's that good. You know, if you think of an amazing bar or restaurant, you know, it's got an amazing atmosphere, but what is it about that place mm. that really makes that happen? And suddenly for me, in, in, in all of the spaces that we've got to now create, is there's now, and I'm really pleased about it, but there's now this pressure that we've got to create that magic dust. Yeah. You know, we've got to create that magic feeling, atmosphere, the thing that we can't put our finger on, but Whatever it is, it makes it really special. So when we go and hang out there, it's amazing. And it, and it kicks us off as human beings. We're, we're simple things. Human beings are simple <laughs> things. And you know, we should have mastered these places that we live in and work yeah. in by now. I mean, and we're still, yeah. we're still trying to do it. But I think in the same way with retail, you know, we saw this happen. It started happening many, many years ago. You, know, you don't need the bricks and mortar store to go shopping, yeah. but people still want to go shopping if the experience is good enough. You don't need an office or a, a workplace to go to, to work. So yeah. what is it that we do to bring people there? And I think that, so to me, so I, I've, my career's kind of spanned across the workplace, workplace strategy for many, many years, and also the urban scale. Dealing with place in both scales and, and everything in between, which is thinking again about really understanding people and behaviour and shaping a, a place around them. And there are some real fundamentals of human behaviour that you can mm. design for that are you know, the, the simple side of things. So knowing how people move through a space based on sight lines and orientation and origin destination things, knowing you know, environmental stimuli, colours, light, scale, all of those things which have to underpin all good design. But the extra layer on top, I think, varies across scale. So in an urban scale, that's kind of mass, and you're trying to deal with human behavior at a mass scale. But what always fascinated me about the workplace is these different layers of human behavior that, mm. that take you from the simple to get to that magic dust that is authentic to that particular organization. So you've got, at the top of that, you know, we are designing workplaces for a business and an organization with a culture 
and values and a mission and and that's what you need to represent and Ooh. so you've got certain behaviors that are almost mandated by a culture the way of doing things here within within certain kind of rules and ways of being and a brand essentially Ooh. of a business and that's kind of one layer of behavior that everyone has to behave within and if you don't then kind of you probably don't really fit in here but of course there's nuances within that which are both you know different teams will have characters there's there's roles that dictate behavior because that those are the tasks you have to do and then within that there's also personality so i think a really interesting thing that again is is not brand new but this idea of how do our different personalities or where we are on you know neurodiversity spectrum influence our behaviors so the idea as well i think of you only go into the office to socialize i think on mass you know, a lot of people are fairly happy working from home and they use that as their concentration place if they have and they've got the luxury of having enough space to do that. But actually for some people, you know, they want the experience of getting out of the house every day and going into the office. So yeah. I think it's really understanding the different layers of behavior within whoever and the client is. And for some people, they will need to go into the office yeah. to work. So some and, will. And this is my deep belief, is that by making spaces that enable us to use them however we want to use them at any time of, of the day, week, then it all kicks off. It all starts to happen. Mm -hmm. So I can be the most efficient for my time. You, you both can be the most efficient. You know, we might be sitting on opposite corners of a building doing completely different functions, but you know, we're both being efficient as individuals. If you kick an organisation off with lots of efficient individuals and you give them a team spirit and a, and a feeling of, of, of being one, one group of people as, as one organisation, not necessarily under one roof or a number of different roofs, but then things start to happen. And, and you know, on, on the urban scale, I, you know, I came into the thing that made me sort of sit back a little bit during the, the P word pandemic was coming into London when, when it was really, really quiet. And, mm -hmm. and it made me think of a conversation I had years ago with a, a tailor on German Street who was in his sort of mid 90s, still working away making these suits. And he, you know, we were chatting outside, and, and he said, I used to play football up and down this street when there, were, there was nothing here. And he said, you know, and that got me thinking, but he said that then there was the smog. The smog wasn't nice. And I remember that conversation when I came into London during the pandemic, because there was nothing here, but the air, it was so fresh. It was completely fresh. And suddenly, London was a completely different place for me. Um, so it's the really big things and the simple things and, and perhaps, you know, perhaps do we over try and overthink things a little bit and over control them? And, and actually, by not controlling things, I think then good things start to perhaps happen. Mm. I think there's also a danger with, not danger, but, you know, historically, when you were designing to brand and culture and you were trying to layer this, sort of, you know, how you should work and almost pre prescribe how people should mm. be working within that organization was because it was people were to your point earlier working to work you know they were living to work or working to yeah. work which way around it was but and i whereas now i think people are much more aware of who they are who they want to work with what their values are how their values align with their business so actually there's a whole sort of layer of workplace brand cultural organizational design that's become a lot simpler yeah and maybe that allows us to push harder around the periphery of things that maybe we weren't doing so much before, whether it's around experience or whether it's around the amount of space or whereabouts people are located. You can maybe have slightly more challenging conversations because the people within the organization are much more aligned. Yeah, so, and I think, well, I th and I th so the other thing I think is, is values is, is, a, is a whole new realm to help define and shape space around. You know, if, we, if you can't, you typically in, in workplaces, there's lots of consultation and you know, workplace consultancy and you're doing the interviews, the focus groups, all of that, um, which usually, ideally, you can do on an urban scale, bigger scale, you can't always do, or some of that, the campus scale mm. work that you're, you're doing. You can't speak to everyone. And we do, though, just see so you know. <laughs> Thousands and thousands. <laughs> well, surveys and stuff like that. But you can, traditionally, there's been quite crude kind of bucketing of people into personas that are usually based on demographics. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there really needs to be a shift away from that. You know, bucketing everyone of the same age 
age group mm. into what that, that doesn't define That's the your over controlling that I yeah. think yeah. we, we, we you, shouldn't do. Yeah, yeah, but if you can actually really start to understand what drives people and what drives behaviours through values, I think it's a very different way of understanding people and their mm. behaviours and, and crafting places that really resonate with people based on values is a very different way and you end up with rather than very generic places that you're trying to work for everyone mm. in these meaningless categories mm. but crafting things that are meaningful to a certain group of people that will really resonate so do you think have there been any any big shifts even in you know, so to me i think for for many years this idea of people-centered design or designing for humans was kind of a bit of a buzzword but i don't think people were fully doing it do you think people are now? Is there an imperative, more of an imperative than before? I think it means something different now. I think you know, human-centered design. You know, historically, I'd always think you know, it was about ergonomics and and maybe comfort. It was very physical. You know, so it was very much about this sort of physical person. Whereas I think there's a lot more around sort of, you know the mental health and and and, and sort of values and mm. sort of human in a broader sense than just. Physicality. So I think that's. I think that's a nice progression. By the way, I think that's, mm. that's really sort of very, very positive. Because um, I think it's very difficult to design badly for people from a physical sense. So actually, now that we're broadening that discussion, I think it's a lot more beneficial. I mean, I get really excited about you know my kids, who in a decade's time will be entering the workforce. I think we're on the cusp now of totally redefining whether we call it an office or not, but redefining yeah. what that environment is for them to work in. And I think it's great. You know, a couple of years ago, when I always go back to my mum, who would say, "Oh God, you must be worried. I've just read there's, you know, the death of the office. What are you going to do for a job?" And I'm like, "This is the best time I've ever had in my whole entire yeah. life. I'm about yeah. to completely redefine it. It's yeah. amazing." Um, well, years of trying to get people to actually, you know, give up a desk and, <laughs> and, and think about the workplace differently and, and work yeah. flexibly. Why are you thinking about desk? <laughs> we need, we need, we need COVID to come along long before that, and we can no, actually. I, well, look, <laughs> Couple of you know, there's, there's, there's various examples through history where you need a shop to to, to implement change, yeah. and 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 for all the the horrible of context of yeah. the pandemic, actually for the for the office, I don't like. I'm not going to drop the term the office. I, I don't mind it, but I do go think. On. But I do drop think. Drop it. Go on. But I do think <laughs> it has to develop into something way better than it ever yeah, was. Yeah, it has um, to. And, um, and 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 I'm a big believer that that's what's coming. You know, we're going to see much much better. Environments and not from the old-fashioned human design thing, but from a broader mm. understanding of yeah. humans and what we actually need. But again, I think lots of our fundamentals of human behaviour won't change. Of wanting to come together to interact, to Focus. transact. That's what yeah. cities and, and offices were always about. It was about coming together. There will be more digital, though. We will. Well, that's we, the, what was my next we question. Will, yeah. I mean, I, that that is gonna. That's we're gonna see a huge advancement in. You know, you, you, can, you know, everyone from the Cisco's to the team, Microsoft Teams or Zoom or whatever we're using, they're all in this massive race to be the people that can truly deliver hybrid because hybrid working doesn't exist. You know, I'm, I'm just doing more remote working and more video conferencing. That's the reality. That's not a good life, though, is no, it? It's not. It's no. not a good life. Well, beyond so, the digital, what about like the metaverse as a space? So we well, about like, I think that's where it will get better. So if we're, if we're just doing this thing at the minute, which is you're like, you know, video conferencing and it's all a bit flat. The minute we can make the experience, the digital experience, or whether it's metaverse or not, but the minute we can make that feel more human, feel more inclusive, feel more so that you're collaborating and you're more in a the, physical space, the better. The, the, the physical space is falling well behind the digital space. And, you know, is the digital space a quick, short term trend? Because, you know, at the end of the day, we're still going to be human beings. Um, so actually human being face-to-face -face contact what happens to that you know I mean I'm not making statements I'm raising questions you know when when the telephone was first invented everyone slated the poor chap who invented it on the basis that everyone would stop talking to one another face-to-face -face. but actually you know the communication rates went through the through the sky so I think I think the the, the big change is that you know all of a sudden everyone is not designing differently and uh, yeah they're starting to and thinking about it and talking about it. it it will take time to morph i think the the fantastic thing is that there's now the justification for a designer to do something different and that's where then the the shift is going to come and you know i i, I remember in one of our projects we 
uh, I had a journey through up and down the UK and had an awful experience with some really horrible toilet door handles when I needed to take a pee in the, in the, in the UK's petrol service stations. <laughs> so we came up with a plan, pre-P word, pandemic word, um, where actually in one of our, our higher class headquarters, we, we had electric automatic lobby doors in and out of a toilet. So you, you didn't really need to touch that. You know, so we were thinking then a little bit about hygiene, and we got absolutely pummeled for this idea on the basis that it would cost too much, it would break down, it would just be a pain in the backside. And of course, post-pandemic, everyone, first thing everyone's <laughs> yeah. doing when we all go back to, to work a little bit is, oh, fantastic, well done, that was genius. You know? So there's the justification now for, for, for things to be rethought through and reinvented, mm -hmm. re-evaluated, um, and that's what's exciting about it, you know. And if we end up back where I'm proven wrong and actually we're all sat back in the office in a few years' time, I'll take it on the chin. But, no, but um, also you know. I think that'll be for a reason, you know, that if, if actually we're missing whatever it is that that was doing for us that we need it. I mean, I think it's, I think it's just being open to how we evolve and what behaviours we have at the time and what yeah. we need. I think there's also yeah. a realisation that, that you, you work in a space, I work in a space, and we design spaces for clients that... I, I would never have called them offices in the traditional sense anyway, mm, right? Yeah. Whether it's nightclubs or bars or theatres or whatever, it's the spaces we were designing for the type of brands we designed for. But, but outside of that, there were a whole host of businesses that had really shit space. Oh, right? yeah, and, yeah. And so, and so I, think, I think we will see more people come back, but they will come back to not the same spaces as before. They're going to come back to yeah. the better spaces. I mean, uh, yesterday I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go and have a meeting at the civic centre of one of our lovely London boroughs and it was an absolutely diabolical experience mm. and you know I, I can't I, I honestly I was astonished I was astonished at how people actually operate and mentally wise and I mean it was just it was appalling um, I've, I've seen to a degree slightly better prisons actually it was dreadful and, and as I as I requested the as I requested the password for uh, for the Wi-Fi, and and you know the, the officer said to me, "Well, it's the word imagination." So, and I thought, bloody hell, what a what, you know, what a joke. And yeah. and is that with a capital I or or you know, you know well, it's all in capitals, you know. And I thought, oh, oh. you know, and and so yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. We we have a responsibility as a, as a sector profession, you know, we have a responsibility to dig deep really you know really change things and turn things upside down whilst we've got this this justification uh because that will then become the norm um i mean there's I, the the churchill quote you know we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us and that's totally. exactly what we're doing so what yeah. are the buildings that we are now shaping and what are the behaviors that we want to to shape and yeah. and, and live kind of thereafter yeah. um, conscious of time and whether there are any questions in the audience yeah. We've got about 10, 15 minutes. If not, I'm sure we can carry on chatting, but does anyone have a question? So I have a question. So as a designer, I think designers inherently want to create amazing spaces. And it's not that we're just saying, eh, let's just make sucky spaces. Good projects start with good clients. Mm -hmm. And they have to value what we're doing and their people. And there are a lot of great workspaces out there that exist, primarily for companies that do that. So I think actually we're at a great point because now well, everybody is rethinking work and the workplace, valuing what we bring to the table, and the C-suite now can see people are our biggest asset and we have to invest in them. So I don't think it's designers that need to be bashed. I think it's, we have to have clients that see the value, and we have to step up to the table and do much, much better. That's the point. That's the point. And I think that's the justification. You know, that's at the end of the day, our clients need probably nine times out of ten the commercial justification for, for this extra push, which is fantastic. Um, and yes, there's some fantastic designers and fantastic spaces, but there's also there's also, you know, and it sounds rude, but I'm going to say it loud, is that there's also a lot of, a lot of regurgitation that's going on. And, 
and, and actually, you know, if we shift this way, the regurgitation will follow with us as well. And, and overall, things will improve. Um, but I couldn't agree more with you. I couldn't agree more. The, the release, the license to thrill for, for everyone as a designer is that commercial justification now because, again, you're absolutely right, it's suddenly all about people. And COVID, to me, was the first opportunity ever that we had a global workplace survey by everybody around the world all at the same time and they all voted with their feet. Mm. So we have to we have to sort that out. I think for a long time having a good workplace was a real perk that like set a company apart, whereas now it's it's not really a question. Okay, but I think we're gonna fall on our face. Why? Because I think clients a lot of our clients have never been in this situation before. Some have. That people have been working in a hybrid manner for a long time and people have been working remotely for a long time. Yeah. But the majority of the people haven't ever experienced me working at home and you being in the office. Because for the last two years, everyone was at home. Okay. So what, when we're asking our clients, what do you want? I think that's a stupid question. Because it's at, like asking somebody who's never been to a restaurant before what their favorite dish at that restaurant is. We have years of experience. We've eaten at that restaurant a hundred times. Our clients need us to be bold mm. and to lead and to leverage our experience and say, we've been here before. Let me tell you what's good on this menu and what's not and what's likely to happen. And I think there are a lot of people right now that are very afraid to lead and be bold because they're afraid they're going to get skewered and said that they're being unsympathetic or out of touch. And so they're, I think we're asking stupid questions. Well, yeah, but you, you need the client with a vision to take you to the right restaurant in the first place. So, uh, so I agree, but, you, but there's, there's so much we can bring, but you do need the, the client with a vision to make sure that you're at the right restaurant with the right menu in the first place, right? So I think, and with the right people across the table to have that mm. discussion. But I think we have to be stronger. We've turned a couple of clients yeah. down who came to us with a brief. They had a brief that said vision, future, workplace, and then you looked at the time frames and the budgets and all that, other, and you said, you, you don't understand. This is all just buzzwords that you've read in the newspaper or the media. And we turn those projects down because they're not ready to sit down yet and have a grown-up conversation about what the future is. So I think it, it, it's not one-sided. It has to be a marrying of they're ready for it, they have the vision, but we have to rise to the challenge and, and respond mm. to it. Yeah. We're, we're, we're effectively talking about shifting, shifting the median, aren't we? We're, we're shifting that line. We've all got clients that, you know, um, a door to be envisioned and, and shown the way and educated and you know we we've 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 got clients that have come to us with a vision we've had clients where we've had to sort of almost scare the living daylight out of them and then they've always thanked us yeah. for doing that at the end of a, of a project and so it, it's always a different cycle I, I refer to it as the marriage counseling part of being a designer you know you've got to create the trust, the bond with your client, you've got to become a team, you've got to lose the client, mm. design a relationship, you know, that hierarchy, you've got to work at it. And, and, and it's very difficult to, to it, it's, again, it's back to people skills, isn't it? You, you know, to create a great project, you've got to have a group of people, people skills, you know. So it's back to people, isn't it? Um, but we're, we're talking about shifting the medium. And I, I agree totally with everything you're saying. But I think within that as well, there's also the missing element. So yes, I think a lot of clients don't know what they want and, and they're kind of in this tricky situation where we've all had to trust our people to work from home. There's now a, an issue about bringing them back. Lots, some people want to come back, some people don't. A lot of companies are scared to mandate too much with the risk that their people might say, no, I want more flexibility. I've been given flexibility. I've proven it. I quite like my new life. And I think what you get there is there needs to be some middle ground between the people and the company, knowing that the people still work for the company. And I think there's, there's been this gulf between the I and, and then the company. And I think somewhere there needs to be the we of, it's all well and good if, if I want to go in on a Tuesday because it works around whatever else I have in my life. If my colleague wants to come in on a Thursday because it works for her life and he wants to come in on a Friday because it works for him, that doesn't really work for the team. But see, that has to go both ways. Because I, I believe right now, really sorry to say this, I really believe right now that the workforce is thinking very me-centric. Mm. Oh, exactly. Very, very selfish. Mm. They're not thinking, what's going to sustain the business? Totally. Mm -hmm. How are we going to pass on knowledge? What's going to happen to my career if I'm not going into the office? 
what's going to happen to my colleagues who I'm not there those days and they need to cover for me or whatever those things are. And the C-suite is getting skewered right now for being out of touch, but they're scared to death that businesses are going to suffer and there's not going to be resiliency. And I don't know about you guys, I'm going to retire one day. And so we have to pass on that knowledge. And I don't think the workforce is thinking about the long-term ramifications. It's like we're living on credit and that bill is going to come due. And most of the C-suite that we talk to fears that their businesses are going to get it on the chin, but they're terrified to mandate because they're going to be skewered in the press as being out of touch with what the workplace, what the workforce wants. And the workforce has to understand if the businesses aren't thriving, you won't have a job. I know. Yeah. So it ha you have to meet in the middle. And it's not just about what you want. It's how do you work? What do your teammates need? What kind of businesses are you in? All of those things. We are not asking the right questions. Totally. And, and that's what I mean, right I think, in terms of creating the, right the structure. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. providing something between the I and the we of the company and creating a structure that is, as you say, from our experience of knowing what actually works for the bits of work that need to be done together, people are able to come in to do those bits together. I mean, look, I'll give you an extreme example of this. So Apple. Apple is totally about everybody coming together and that synergy of failing fast together. Okay. For them to tell people that they could work remotely was a massive shift for them. And so when Tim Cook said, all right, we're going to let you, we're going to ask you to come in three days a week, but we're going to let you work from home two days a week. And 80 people signed a letter and said, yeah, that's not good enough for us. If I were him, I would have said, so you think Steve Jobs was wrong? Because he built one of the most expensive buildings on the planet because he believed so much in you guys coming together and the power of people coming together and synergizing and coming together. But you think we can innovate just as fast by everybody being scattered to the winds. And I, I put $100 of your money on the table that <laughs> says, they would have said, oh, no, 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 I, I didn't say the company would be better off. You asked me what I wanted. Yeah. I want to do this. So see, I think we have to come to the middle and we have to, we have to frame this better. I don't think as an industry we are framing this well. I really don't. I do think a responsibility of a leadership of a business is making sure that your staff share the same vision that you share and the same, the same values you share. Yeah. And, 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 and that, and that makes the business Exactly. And, and, and so, and, you know, speaking to the clients last week, we were saying, you know, you do need to lead with a, a people first message. You know, it needs to be about them because, to your point, that's how they're thinking at the minute. But you need to make sure that back to back with that are the business reasons for doing it so that very slowly over time you can, you can begin to blend that communication so that you're suddenly talking about the we because you've started to break down the silos that have existed for the last few months. It's really tricky. It, mm. it's, it's all language and semantics, and actually the visions can be fairly similar in the right organization. But if they don't truly believe in the values of the organization anyway, then actually... I'm a big believer in that as well. Yeah. You know, then it's, it's time to move on, it is, isn't yeah. it? And, yeah. I, you and know, you're trying I, to keep someone that maybe... You know. I think, I think there's so many fundamentals in all of this. Is, you know, the, the, the CEO can't force... Um, the, the modern mindseted person to go and work in the old-fashioned office. We know that. Equally, the person that you know wants you know all of the conveniences for family life has got to also give back a bit in terms of you know what I do need to go into the town, into the city for some of the time of the week to actually contribute to the company and, and, and whether that's you know socialising in that building or whether it's actually sitting down or a mixture or a blend at different hours 24-7 there's a contribution to that. The, the, the heart and soul of a business comes from the people and you know if there's a, a great big you know this great big thing about this great big resign if that's everyone doing the shift that you've mentioned just then then let it happen and let's all settle back down and get back on with it but I think anyone forcing, if, if we as an industry, as a, as a profession, try to force people back to the new office that we've decided should be, I think that's equally a fail. Mm. So I think that the, the, the whole thing needs to be a bit of a, a sort of a concerted effort for businesses, us as individuals and, and designers to, do you know what, push hard collectively to find what it is that works for everybody. Because if we can find that, we're all onto a winner. And the um, model will continually change as well. I, it will, for years, it's going to completely the dial is going to be shifting all over the place. And in, in, in our world, and I'll be like to, to our studio at BDG around what we're doing. 
So if our vision is to design for change and to help clients that are going through a change, and our way of doing that is to be in a studio and collaborate, and a lot of that at the minute is face-to-face -face because that's how it is in the minute because the platforms, the technology, the software that doesn't exist anywhere near as well or performs anywhere near as well as being in a room together Ooh. and pinning things up and solving problems and being in front of clients. But I think that will change. So I know as a leader of my business that I have to be flexible that when those platforms come online and when those tools become better and when people can collaborate with the same level of intensity and innovation and accident, because accidents are probably the best things that happen in a design studio, the things you don't expect to happen when they happen are probably the most powerful. Those things will come over time and we have to always be aware that I think from now on, it's that ability to shift and bend quickly is going to be the most powerful tool in business. I think. Yeah. See you in the metaverse. <laughs> I'm already in there. <laughs> I, I'm not. That's why I'm not seeing. You. Um, does anyone else have any questions or thoughts or? Can I just ask a little question? And you can um, confirm or deny. But this office that turns from a nightclub from an office into a nightclub—is it happens to be in Downing Street? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I can confirm that it is. Yeah. 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 Um, they were practicing all of last year, turning it on. And yeah. Up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my lord. Yeah. 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 Get involved in politics. Could be the next. Could be the next client, couldn't it? <laughs> Any other questions, or is that a good, <laughs> a good note yeah. to finish on? Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks.